Hey, John here. Let's wrap up our pointer uh, tutorial here. I've got a bunch of tests in one big file here. So let me comment these out down below here, all right? So what are we going to do first here? We're going to run this one function, and then main is going to exit down here. It's going to return, okay? So let's look and see what this function does. This function comes up here and does this. Now, uh, just for demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and compile this. This will fail. To show, if I declare a pointer, right? I got a thing called PFX that is a pointer to a float. And I'm going to initialize this variable with the address of another variable called i. This is a perfectly valid pointer, but it's a pointer to a type of a variable that's an int. So the compiler will say, I don't want you to make your float pointer point at an int. That's illegal, all right? So let's go ahead and compile it. And sure enough, it says I can't make a, 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 a convert an int star to a float star. Okay, so no, don't do this. My own comment to myself. All right, so that's just not good. All right, so don't do that. That's why this was commented out earlier. So okay, let's go on here to uh, see what's going on. Uh, so yeah, there's no arguments in here, and it's void. I, this exists solely for just to containerize this series of examples here. So let's look at what's going on. So we have three variables that are of type float, and I initialize them to recognizable values. Float 1 is a bunch of 1s. Float 2 says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Float 3 says 7, 8, 9, 0, 1, 2. Okay? What am I going to do? I'm going to just print out their values on a line here, and then I'm going to print some other uh, stuff out. I'm printing out the addresses of F1, F2, F3, so that we just know where everything is in memory, so we can look and see what's going on down here. After all, we're talking about pointers, so their values when they have addresses assigned to them, we need to know which one they're pointing at. Okay, so that's just for reference. Now, what am I doing here? Let's look and see what's uh, this convention here. I've, I've printed out a message that includes some code like this, and then right after that message, I do the code that it says, and after that, I'm going to print out some other variables so I can see what's going on. So, let's start with this one. I've got a pointer to a float, and I'm going to initialize it to the address of a variable called f1, which we saw above is a float. So in my head, I'm looking at this, pf1 points at f1, okay? Now I print out the f1, f2, f3 again. I just cut and pasted this line over and over again uh, so that you can see that I either did or did not modify any of the values of these variables each time. After that, I'm going to print out the current value of this pf1, right? So this will be the value that pf1 has in it, which in this case is the address. So you can see clearly at that time that it will have the address of F1. And then I'm going to say star PF1 equals, and then I'm going to show me the value of the thing that PF1 points at, right? Because I'm dereferencing that pointer. And we've seen this before. So far, so good. Now, I'm going to create a second pointer, PF2. And I'm going to point it at PF1 as well. And again, dump everything out. And of course, I'm adding an extra line here because I got another variable now, right? Again, in my head, I'm looking at this when I'm thinking about what this means. PF2 points to F1. Why? Because I copy the value of PF1 up here. And PF1 at this time has the address of F1 in it. Okay. So by doing this, I'm copying the contents of the pointer to PF2. I'm not touching F1 at all. I'm just grabbing the value of this pointer that happens to be the address of F1 right now. Okay, so both when we're done, both PF1 and PF2 will both be pointing at F1. Okay, what happens down here? I'm going to change what PF2 points at. Above this, it was pointing at F1, right? Now I'm going to say, make it point at F2. Nothing wrong with that. And again, in my head, now I'm thinking, you know, PF2 now points at F2. And again, I print everything out so we can see what's going on, what changed and what it was and what it is now. Then what do I do? I'm going to create something. I mean, if I have a star, you know, a, a, a PF, let's keep going too far. If I have a variable that looks like this up here, right? PF2 is a pointer to a float. 
Well, that's just a simple variation of what you see down here. I'm saying PPF now is a pointer to a pointer to a float. I can put as many asterisks in here as I want. Of course, you have to keep track of all that in your head. And uh, so what does that mean? I said PPF equals the address of PF2. So in my head, I'm thinking this. PPF is a variable whose value is the address of the PF2 variable. Now, the PF2 variable itself is a pointer. So now I can continue this thought in my mind and say that, you know, the, the PF points to PF2 points to F2, all right? And PF2 points to F2 because that's what we did up here. All right, so this is a, 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 an extra level of indirection here, okay? Once I've done this, I can print it all out. Now, I put in a comment down here. Keep in mind that when you, in the context of the definition of a new variable, all right, if, when you say, I got a float here, and it, what it, you know, your, your PPF is a pointer to a pointer to a float, these asterisks here have to do with the definition of the variable, Okay, the asterisks down here, when you use that variable, are talking about dereferencing the pointer. Okay, this is defining the kind of pointer. After you've defined it, you're putting stars in front of it have to do with going and getting the value the pointer points to. Okay, and if I put a double star here, I'm grabbing the value of this pointer. Then I'm going to that address and grabbing the value of that pointer, which in this case is PF2. And I put the star in front of it again to say, go get the uh, ultimate value of F2 from there. All right, so this is a double, a double uh, indirect here, okay? Now, uh, whether you do it, whether you initialize it here or down here, it's you're going to end up with the same thing. Well, my point there is, be do not confuse the asterisks in the definition of a variable with the asterisks that occur later when you're using it in uh, in expressions when you're evaluating the the value of the variable. Okay, this means go get the thing it points to. All right, and two asterisks means go get the thing it points to, and then go get the thing that that points to. All right. Again, in my head, I'm I'm seeing this this double double hop here. All right. So now, what's going on? I change the value of the thing that PPF is pointing to and the thing that points to. Right. So I'm going and grabbing, in this case, the value of uh, PF two because it's still pointing a uh, PF PPF is pointing at PF two and PF two is pointing at uh, F two up here, right? It's still set like this, all right? So by doing this, I'm really modifying the value of F two. I wrote my own little comment in here to remember, and I forgot to read my own comments, right? So I'm going to change that thing, and then of course I'm going to print everything out again, and we can see what happens when we run it. Now again, each one of these comments includes the line of code that I'm executing before dumping these results out. It'll make it so we don't have to keep jumping back to this source code. We can just see what's going on by uh, reading these comments uh, in the output. So now what am I doing? I'm going to change the value of PF2 to point at F3. All right, so again, you got to have to keep all this uh, this spaghetti mess of all these things connected together in your head uh, in a line. Now, I've changed PF2. To, it used to point to F2. Now I'm going to change it to point at F3 here, okay? And by doing that, what I've done is 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 changed this double indirect now, okay? I did not change PPF. PPF still points at PF2, but PF2 now points at F3. So if I put two stars in front of Mr. PPF down here, I'm now going to get the value of F3. All right? I should add one more example in here. What's the one I left out, right? You do realize you don't have to put these two asterisks in front of these things, okay? You can still put one in there. Let's go ahead and throw in one extra one. Let's not let's change this to do this. 
one star PPF. What I'm doing now is modifying the pointer that PPF points to. Let's change that to F1 now, okay? So now what I've done is move this over to F1 and change this like this, all right? And I got, of course, do this code. This is the only other case, really, I suppose, that there is. I can change PPF itself, but that's already obvious what I would do there, okay? I certainly hope so. So in doing this, what I've done, by assigning star PPF a new value, what I've effectively done is change the value of PF2, right? Because PF2 is what PPF is pointing at, okay? And because I just changed it to point to a new thing, now, when this runs, I will get a different uh, value. I'll get the value of F1 now when it runs down here. Okay, let's go ahead and compile this and run it and see what's going on. Again, this is, you know, I mean, when you want to learn something new, pointers or anything, you got to write a bunch of test cases like this and then just run the death out of the thing, right? Try a bunch of cases. Make sure that you can make it reveal to you what is happening. Right, I kind of think of this whole thing as, you know, you watch one of those old uh, Perry Mason movies or something, you know, these lawyers and they're asking people on the stand or they trap the, 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 uh, um, the uh, witness, right? They'll ask a bunch of questions and hem in the truth. And what we're doing here is, is kind of hemming in. We're forcing the compiler to reveal the, the truth, the reality. Even if you don't know what you're doing, if you just write a bunch of code like this and print out all these values and look at them, they're either going to be what you believe it should be or they're not. And whenever they're not, you can then go back and figure out why, okay? This is how you coerce it into revealing the truth. This, Honestly, this is how I learned C and C++. There, in my day, there was like very few books. There were some, but not like there is today. I couldn't just sit down and read it. You, you just had to write all these test programs. So if you don't like reading, at least there's a way to do this. But this is long and arduous and painful if this is the only way. All right. What I'm trying to do is introduce these concepts. Once you understand, oh, that something's possible, you can either do this and continue, or you can go find, uh, you know, uh, online tutorials and other references and texts, and and read more about it. This is just one approach, uh, and hopefully it worked for you like it did for me. But it will take some time to run all these tests, is my point, all right? So anyway, so what do we got going on here? I got the three variable, F1, F2, F3. We sign them those values. Yeah, that makes sense. They have a place in the machine. They must have addresses, and here they are. I don't know what they're going to be. They're going to sign, you know, uh, these are going to be in the activation records, right? Because those are local variables to that function that's printing all this stuff, right? And if you look at these numbers over here, it makes a lot of sense. Why would they be put randomly all over the entire system? They're not, right? <laughs> they're right next to each other, okay? Uh, that's, you know, again, purely coincidence, but not surprising at all, just because of the way we know the activation records work. All right, so now what happens? We assign uh, or we define a thing called PF1, which is pointed to float. We assign it the address of F1. So we look in here, and what do we got? The address of F1 is blah, 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 9C04. Not a shock that PF1 has that address in it. And if we dereference that address, we're getting the value of F1 up here, right? which I repeat down here as well for local reference. Okay, great. Then I say uh, PF2 is a pointer to a float. I define a new variable, okay, and I assign it the value from PF1. So what I'm really doing is copying the pointer address over to PF2 here, okay? And it makes perfect sense that if I print out both of these values should be the same because I just set them equal to each other, right? And then later on, uh, if I dereference PF2, it should not come as any surprise whatsoever. If I dereference the same address twice, I better get the same value, all right? If that was not the same, then your computer's probably broken. Uh, what's going on now? If I then later on change PF2 to point somewhere else, which is perfectly fine, 
you can now see that uh, I set it to the address of PF2, whose value is still this. You can see these addresses now have changed, right? So, so the PF2 variable now equals this, and you scroll back up here, and you can clearly see that's the address of F2, makes perfect sense. And uh, the value of F2 gets printed out if I dereference the pointer to PF2. All right. Okay, what's next? I got a double pointer here. PF is a pointer to a pointer to a float. And I initialize it to the address of PF2. So let's look and see what's going on here. So PPF has this in it. The thing that ends in C10. Well, presumably that's the address of where the PF2 variable is located. If I say star PPF, then I'm looking at the value of the thing that PPF is pointing at, which should be the value of the PF2, which ends in 9C08, and that is the value of PF2. This here is printing the value of PF2 much the same way that this here, star PF2, is printing the value of the thing that PF2 points at. This is just pointing to a pointer. So that's the value of the thing it points at. Perfect. So if you do a double star PPF, I say dereference PPF and get the value of this that is itself a pointer, and then dereference it a second time to go get the float value, which is this, that this thing is pointing at. And you can clearly see that's what you get up here, and that is, of course, uh, the value of F2. Star star PPF equals pi. Well, it should make perfect sense that if I'm double, you know, if I'm, if I'm dereferencing this thing, I'm modifying the value of the thing that the pointer to the pointer <laughs> refers to, right? And since uh, uh, whatever it is, the star, uh, PPF is, is pointing at the, uh, the current, uh, the PF2 variable, right? So I'm going to change something to pi, and then you can clearly see that, that that is what happens here, okay? And again, I dump everything out. Now, I've modified it by way of double dereferencing the PPF variable, okay? And you can clearly see that's the, the pi. Look and see, it's also changed by looking at it through PF2, right? Well, and that makes sense anyway, because PF2, this value here, is this value here, because PPF points to PF2, which points to the value pi in F2 up here, all right? Again, think of this as boxes. You know, each variable has a value. That value is either, you know, a, a pointer or, you know, in this case, a float, okay? Or a pointer to a pointer to a float. All right, so now what happens? If I change the value of PF2, I'm changing what PF2 points at. I change it to F3. So again, when I print out, I go, okay, the value in F2 now is different than it was before. That makes sense because I changed it. And if I say star PF2, I dereference PF2, I'm now seeing the value of F3 now instead of the old one, F2. And look at the double indirect over here, okay? Remember, the, the, the value of PPF is the same as it's been for quite a while, okay? In fact, I've never changed it. It always points at PF2. But since I changed PF2, when I double dereference this one to get the value of the thing it points at, that has changed. And therefore, this has changed. Okay? The value has changed because it's pointing at a different variable now. It used to be pointing at F2 over here, in this one up here, but now it points at F3. So this thing, that's why you see this down here, okay? Again, you're going to have to keep all this stuff in your mind, and it gets much worse 
when you have pointers to pointers to pointers to pointers or pointers to classes or structures and other objects within them, you can have multiple pointers that point all over the place, okay? So you can get quite a spaghetti bowl going. These are the easy ones, okay? So just, you know, take it easy, take it slow. And again, you, you diagram these things out if you have to. And you go to any real office with any programmers and stuff and any large projects and look at their whiteboards and things, and that's what you see. You see diagrams of little boxes with their names on them and arrows pointing all over the place. Why? Because nobody can do all this in their heads. You need to draw these out or you will have problems, okay? Don't for one minute think you're the only one who needs to do that. Everyone needs to draw these things out. Okay, what's the last one here? If I go in, oh yeah, that's the one that we just added. So if I say star PPF equals ampersand F1, look what I've done here. Again, PPF is the same as it's been all along. But star PPF represents the value of the thing that PPF points to, which is the uh the the uh, pf2 variable it's still pointing at pf2 so what i did here is i changed the value of pf2 right look what happened here star pf2 it it, it now has the value of f1 in it right here look what i had a minute ago up here pf2 was pointing at f3 so if I say star PF2, I get the value of F3. Now I changed PF2 by way of this PPF variable, and I changed what it points at. So now when I say, hey, show me the contents, what is PF2? You can see the value has changed, and, and therefore you, you know, you're printing out a different thing. It's printing out uh, F1 now. And if I do the double indirect on PPF, it makes perfect sense. Once again, PPF is pointing at PF2. Therefore, when we do, we do a single star in front of PPF, we get the value of F2. And because that has been changed, the value of, of the thing F2 points at looks like this, right? Which is your F1, okay? So each level of indirection, you add an extra star, and you can only assign a value to a variable that matches the type of thing that it might uh that it's supposed to point to right can't point at an int if you got a float pointer and so on and uh that will help you enormously that the compiler gripes about that because when we start creating uh objects and things like that uh you're gonna have to deal with these things all over the place well let's go ahead and just run this pointer comparison one and keep this commented out you can comment this one out too well make it more obvious Oops, right? Okay, so what happens here? Pointer comparison. Let's look at this function. It uh, should be a short one right here. Okay, let's look at now what it means to compare pointers with like less than, greater than, equal to, and stuff like that. Let's look what's going on. We print out a nice thingy, a nice header. We create a nice variable. This is yet another way to create a, a, a thing that represents the size of your array. I'll just change this a few times and go through some variations in different lectures. You can see some different styles. Um, uh, create uh, an array with 100 elements in it, right? And then print out the address of where the array is for our reference, okay? Then what do I do? I say if uh, I fill in for i is 0, less than i size, set the element at i to 100 plus i. Again, I think I explained this before. I'm creating initialization data for the array such that if I see the value of an element in the array, I can know what the index was and vice versa. This will go from 101, or 100 in this case, because it started at 0, and then go 101, 102, and all the way up to 199 for the last element, right? Because the elements go from 0 to 
one less than the total number of elements in there. So the, ind the legal indexes for this array go from 0 to 99. So this thing will let me know. I put an extra 1 in front of it so that if I ever look at it, I can tell the difference between if I print out the index variable for the array, which would go 0 to 99, or the value of the array at some index, which will go from 100 to 199. Again, keep my uh, situational awareness uh, by creating uh, useful test data. Again, this is just for demonstration purposes. I mean, yeah, normally this would not be much use otherwise, okay? All righty, what do we do here? I got uh, two pointers, all right? I got an array of integers, therefore I can say P1 equals AI. This will point at AI0. You can also put ampersand AI0. It's the same thing, right? Then I say, give me another pointer, P2 equals the address of the location where the 10th element is stored. Okay. And because we know how arrays are stored in the machine's memory, which is why I've been beating that topic, we know that AI sub 0 has an address number in it. I should say, the address of AI0 is less than the address of AI10. By definition, this is a definition of, in the language, a fundamental truth about the language itself. If you have the address of two different elements in the same array, you're guaranteed that the element with the lower index number has a smaller address than the one at the higher index number. We've seen that due to the way we know how the uh, elements of the arrays are laid out in memory. Therefore, it makes perfect and reasonable uh, sense to be able to do things like this. So what is this loop going to do? Well, P1 is less than P2. This is comparing the address that's in the P1 pointer variable to the address in the P2 pointer variable. And then I'm going to just print out, here's P1 and here's P2. Or what am I doing? I'm printing out P1 and the value that P1 is pointing at. Okay, so if you look at the code here, it starts out by pointing at the beginning of the array. And due to this loop here, the very first element in the array will be 100 plus 0, which is 100, right? So this loop will go through here, and it should say that star P1, the first time through that loop, it'll print out 100. And we'll be able to see the address that P1 points to, which should be the exact same address that we see as for reference up here. Okay? We add 1 to P1. And this is pointer arithmetic. So it will add to the address number in hex, right? It adds size of, in this case, int. Or what we might say, size of... Another way to think about it is this, right? Size of the thing that P1 points at, okay? P1 equals P1 plus that. That's literally what's happening. However, you never want to code this because if you look at this, this will be 4. And, and if you do this, it'll do pointer arithmetic and multiply that by 4. Okay? So inside the language, the part that we don't manipulate, what I've written here is exactly what will happen. But you can't do it like this in C because it will then apply times size of again. You see what's going on there? That's just a little side note. Uh, don't worry too much about that example. It's a little outside the, the absolute specifics that you need to know about. If I add 1 to P1, the takeaway is we're really adding 4 to the address in there. And you'll see all that when I print all this out and it goes, okay? So let's go ahead and compile and run this one. Yeah, I just run it again. So it says comparisons, FYI, A, uh, I starts at this thing, ends at 0, C, 40. So I say, good, pi, uh, P1 equals AI, P2 equals AI10. And we print these things out. Now look and see what's going on here. PI equals, you know, blah, 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 0, C, 40. And that makes sense because that should be the first element. And that is P2 is the 10th element. Well, this is not 0, C, 40 plus 10. This is 0, C, 40 plus, you know, uh, uh, 28, right? 
in hacks which is uh, 32 plus, that's a plus 40. And that makes perfect sense in decimal because 10 elements of this array consume 10 times 4 bytes, which is 40. Don't worry so much about converting hacks. It helps to know how to do it, and there's links in the uh, course website, which I'll connect to below this video if you want to know more about hacks and decimal and all that fun stuff. Okay, so what's going to happen? I print this out at the top of the loop, and then I enter my loop, and I say, well, P1 is less than P2. P2 is 60, blah, 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 0, 68, and this one is blah, 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 0, uh, same thing as C40, right? So the first time through the loop, P1 is the 0, C40. That makes perfect sense. And star P1 should be the thing it's pointing at, which is the first element, and that makes perfect sense that it's the 100. Beautiful. I add 1 to P1 with plus plus P1, and you can see it went up by 4 in hex, which is 4 in decimal. So you're going to see 40, 44, 48. 8 plus 4 in hex is C. C plus 4 is you know 1, 0 in hex. So you're going to see 0, 4, 8, C, and then another one uh, with a carry. So you got 50, 54, 58, 50, C. And then you're going to see 60, 64, and so on. That 0, 4, 8, C, 0, 4, 8, C is a very common sequence because integers are 4 bytes long, and if you're ever looking at addresses and iterating on arrays of integers or floats, they're also 4 bytes. You always see this 0, 4, 8, C, 0, 4, 8, C, this, this pattern, okay? So what's going on? here. The first one is 100. Second one's 101, 102, 103, 104. This is exactly what it should be, okay? Again, uh, review that little bit of a loop there. Okay, so what are we doing here? We're printing out this P1 and star P1, and then we're adding one. or moving, we can say, point to the next element, I guess. Point to the next int element, all right? We'll put quotes in there. All right, that's what we're doing when we add one. We're doing uh, point arithmetic, so it's adding adding size of the thing it points at. All right, and of course that's exactly what you want. You would never want to do anything else. That's why the language works the way it, it does. If you add and subtract things to pointers, you're adding and subtracting uh, so that you can move around essentially between array elements. Okay, now having said all this. This jazz about the array, you know, the, the first element having a lower address than the tenth element and so on, absolutely true, always true. However, do not for one minute think that if I have an AI array and down here I have like a BI array, do not accept back that these things are laid out in the order that you see them in the screen. In other words, if I have like AI sub 5, and I ask where the address of that is, you cannot guarantee that it'll be less than bi sub something. All right? Why? Because these two are completely different uh, disjoint things. Compiler does not guarantee the order in which these appear in real, in the actual memory, the address space, the running program. Okay? Now, as you see, it just so coincidentally happens that uh, quite often, the activation records put them in the opposite order that you see them here. That's just how this compiler decided to do these things, okay? It's a purely coincidental thing. Do not, for one minute, think you can make any sense of the relative value of two pointers that are pointing to two different, thing, two different arrays or just two random integers somewhere that are not elements of the same array, okay? Now, there's other rules that have to do with identifying and knowing that things are related and not related. But the simplest way to think of this, and probably you can go your whole life in programming with this stuff, and just simply understand that if there's two elements of the same array, you can play this game with these pointers and their relative magnitude. And you can compare them for less than, greater than, not equal, equal, less than or equal to, greater than. All this works perfectly. But if and only if these two pointers that you're doing a relational operation, you know, a, a relational operator in there. Well, if and only if they're, they're, they're both pointing at two elements in the same array. Okay. They could just as easily be talking to bi sub 0 and bi sub 10. That's fine, too. Why? Because they're both pointing to two different elements in the bi array. 
in that scenario, okay? So don't mix these with different arrays, objects, structures, classes. You have to be careful about that. But if you really think about it, the only time you want to do this is when you're iterating over elements in an array. Anyway, this is a very natural thing. It, getting caught up in this in some weird situation is unlikely to happen unless you misunderstand the purpose of pointers, okay? So as long as you get it, the, you, you'll, you'll, you'll never really find the need to compare two addresses of two dissimilar, <laughs> different, uh, you know, uh, disjoint objects. It just doesn't make sense. It shouldn't make sense once you get going with all this stuff, all right? So that's what's going on with these pointer comparisons, the, the, the relative magnitudes. Um, pointer passing, I think this is a logical extension of what we've been seeing so far. Anyway, let's look and see what's going on down here. Uh, this is just, again, extrapolate what you already know. Again, take a step back and don't think about, you know, pigeonholing all these little facts into narrow cubby holes. C is a general language, and what you can do with one variable and one kind of variable, you can do with another kind of variable the same way, okay? So if I got a variable called i whose value is 22, and I have a pointer to an integer... And I initialize it to null pointer, which will have the value zero if you look inside memory or you yeah, print it out, like I think I just might do down here anyway eventually. Yeah, like right here. Uh, what am I doing here? I, so I set i to 22. I set pi uh, to null, null pointer. And then I print out, by the way, I'm about to do this in my comment. And I print out the address of i. We don't need to see PI at this moment because we know it's zero anyway. So then I say, here's the current value of I, and here's the current of PI anyway, even though we know it's going to be zero, okay? Then what do I do? I say PI equals some function, and I pass it that function the address of I. All right? Call a subroutine. The subroutine can return a value. It can be an int. It can be a float. It can be, you know, defined not to return anything at all, like these guys up here. If you've never noticed, these are declared as void, which means these don't return a value. That's what that means, okay, if you don't know yet. Okay, this one down here will return a value. What's this going to return? This is a function that returns a pointer to an int. It's a function that takes as an argument a pointer to an int as well, Okay. So when we call it down here, we say pointer passing, pass it the address of an integer. Okay, we're passing it the address of i over here. And then when it's done, it can return an address. We can assign to a uh, variable whose type is, uh, hi, you know, I'm, I'm pi. I'm a thing that can take the address of a, a, an int as my value, right? So he's going to return a pointer. And I'm going to save it. When I come back, I'm going to say, hey, here's i after I went to this function, and here's the value of pi that this function gave me back. Okay? Now let's see what this function does. What does it do? It says star p equals this. Well, since I have a pointer to an int, and star, you know, pointer called p, star p then says I, this this expression represents the value of the thing that p points to, and I'm saying change it to nine 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 nine. No problem. This is one way to modify something. Like you know, when you're passing an array down or something, you can poke at the elements and change them. This is just a pointer. Same thing. Remember, arrays and pointers kind of work the same. Basically, they work the same way when you when it's an argument to a function. So I can reach back around and modify the thing that p points at. Okay, and if I'm going to return an int, I can return any old thing. Right now, this is absolutely wild, defective weirdness. Right? What is p plus two here? So somebody gives me a pointer and I just <laughs> add two to it and return it. All right, that is legal, and that's perfectly fine. However, in this particular case, it makes no sense whatsoever. So this is a great example of doing something very strange. But for just, you know, illustrative purposes, right, what's going to happen here? I'm giving it the value of the address of i, and it's going to return 
whatever that is, plus 2, which means this function here might be thinking obviously it would be you would see this kind of thing if the function up here was intending to receive a pointer to an element in an array of many elements that's why you would do something like this okay but since i only have a, a single element here this is just insanity but when we come back and print it out, what we will see that this thing here will have returned an address, and that address will be, in hex, 8 bytes bigger than the address of i. Because this function up here thinks, it's written, it's style, is that of uh, thinking of this, this the thing that p points at is an element in an array, okay? Again, just to illustrate what happens, yeah, you can do this, but don't modify the thing that PI is pointing at down here, because it's certainly not pointing here anymore. It could be pointing at uh, some other things. It's pointing at something in what is most in the activation record, right? Because that's where I is, and eight bytes away is other things in the activation record. It'll destroy your 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 activation record and cause your program to die, or silently not die, but do something very strange later on. You know, God knows what it'll do if you change it. Now it's upset because I added a variable for illustrative purposes and uh, didn't do anything to it. Here we go. Remember I added that while we were talking? Okay, here we go. Here's the case where it goes in here. So it says i is 22, pi is null pointer, and so on. The address of i is this thing here, and then I printed out the value of i and the value of pi. I called the subroutine, it comes back. And i has mysteriously changed now to this, and PI, which used to be zero, now is this giant thing over here. And if we look very closely, 9BEC plus 2 times size of the int, which is what it's pointing at, this I, is BF4, right? EC plus 4 would be F0. Because C, it would go D, E, F, and that's the last digit, so then it would go to 1, 0, okay? Which means this that one, the carry, would change the E to an F, and that's what we got down here, all right? And the fact that I modified this I variable that's sitting in this guy's activation record, the scope of I is inside main down here, right? Yet I was able to pass an, a pointer to it over to this function here. So this function can reach reach into the stack frame of main. It doesn't even know what it's doing. Okay? <laughs> it can do insane things like this. Again, you got to be careful when you're messing with pointers. Uh, so it reaches through this pointer, and it can touch things. That's one of the most useful reasons we use pointers. So if you've got something sitting in your activation record and you've got a subroutine and you want that subroutine to modify this thing, one way to do it is to pass the address of it so that it can reach through and it can touch it. All right? Now, you've got an exposure at this point of all the things you can do with pointers uh, and the uh, a fundamental uh, way of manipulating them all. Uh, from here, it should be obvious. You can extrapolate this. You can create an array of pointers to integers and things like that. C is what we call a context-free grammar. If you can have an array of things, things can be anything. It can be an array of ints, floats, int star, right? A pointer, an array of pointers to ints. It can be an array of pointers to pointers to ints. And any, any, anywhere you can put a variable or a type, it can be any type is my point. And therefore, a type could be what we would call an int or an int star or even an int star star, which is this double indirect up here, okay? Again, uh, I can't stress enough that you need to draw these diagrams out to show this kind of a thing going on when you're dealing with these uh, spaghetti bowls of pointers all over the place. Everybody does it that way. Get used to it.
All right. So there you go. Hopefully this has been useful. If you've got any comments or concerns, if I misspeak or anything, please post a note below because this subject can be complicated for a lot of people. And it doesn't help if I say something wrong uh, because I'm trying to read and speak at the same time. I'm not perfect by any means. So anyway, thanks for watching. See you next time.